February basis, along with Dan Breen, along with Sean Tracy, along with other great Republicans. He was in jail at that time. He was in hunger strike at that time. And after there was a treaty, he was in the Civil War, and he fought again on the Republican side. And he again was in prison, again was on hunger strike, again saw friends, patriots, Irish Republicans taken out and executed. This time not by the British, but by people who he had fought alongside previously, people from fighting on the side of the Irish government. And the reason why I mention him, and I think about him a lot, we used to travel around and talk, and we think about events, I remember especially during the first hunger strike led by Brendan Hughes. We talk about Irish history, get a view of a living view of history. And at times I'd say, Mike, how is it possible? How did we end up here, back doing this now? Why is there so much suffering and struggle now? How is it? You were with such great patriots that he talked about in 1916. The great patriots that he had fought alongside with and fought against and beat the black and tans and won the war of independence. You were with such great patriots in the Civil War. How was it that these great men and women, the greatest of Irish men and women, made a deal which said to Malachy McAllister's great-grandparents or Martin McDade's great-grandparents or others in Belfast or Derry or Tyrone or Fermanagh, we're okay down here in places like Tipperary where Mike was from or Offaly where my family's from. We're all, we'll be okay down here. But if you live in those six counties, you and your children and your children's children will grow up as second-class citizens under British rule. You'll be denied decent jobs. You'll be denied decent housing. Uh, the Royal Irish Constabulary, if they meet you on the... Uh, sorry, Ulster Constabulary, if they meet you on the road, they'll remind you that you're a second-class, uh, I won't say citizen, but occupant of the state, somebody the state thinks you can better do without. How was it that they made this agreement, which would lead to civil rights marches being beaten, which would lead to internment, which would lead to Valley Murphy Massacre, which would lead to Bloody Sunday, which would lead to more hunger strikes, which would lead to, oh, much more suffering and death of fellow Irish men and women. And again, them, the generations upon generations. And he'd always say the same thing. And he'd always, he started off, he'd laugh about it a little bit. He said, well, no one ever would have accepted that. No one ever would have agreed to a permanent partition in the north of Ireland. None of the men and women that he fought amongst would have entertained that for a minute. What their leaders were told and what their leaders believed from the British and what the word went out is that the British told them, we want to get out of Ireland. We got bigger fish to fry in India or Pakistan. There wasn't no Pakistan at that point. They were going to push that. In Africa and other places. Oh, uh, but we can't, we have this problem with the unionists, you know, they're unruly and they have all these weapons that we let them bring in. And we don't want a civil war and we don't want violence and we don't want the programs that they leave until they got to 1970. So what we want you to do is help us unite us. And the way you're going to do it is this. You agree to this boundary commission. And this boundary commission is obvious. You know, Tyrone and Fermanagh, they have big nationalist majorities. They're going to have to go with the Dublin government, the 26th county. Derry City, that's going to be yours. We're going to separate that from the north and put it in with the 20th to be governed by Dublin. South Armagh, you look at places like Katy or Cross McGlenn or all of those areas. That's going to have to be, again, part of the area which is governed from Dublin. And what's going to happen is... Our unionist problem, you work with us, it'll go away. They'll see all they got is Belfast and a little area around it. It's not enough to do a thing. And eventually, they'll see how well you're doing, that you are good guys in the 26 counties. And they'll get out, and we'll be able to get out, and that'll be okay. And just work with us for a short period of time, and Ireland will be united, and you'll have peace, and no one will ever go to jail again. That's what they agreed to. They actually fought a civil war because they wouldn't say that uh, there was no Irish Republican had to show allegiance to Britain. 
They felt that strongly about it, and with good reason. But that's what the Civil War was about. And so they waited, and they believed what the British said, and everyone was convinced that that was what was going to happen. Then it came time for that Boundary Commission to meet. And it soon became obvious. Instead of talking about giving up territory, the British went in and said, we want back more territory. We want Port of Monaghan. Mm -hmm. We want, I mean, look at the way they want all of what foil now in areas in Derry. Look at the way they're grabbing on, wanting to grab on to every inch of Ireland to claw back everything they could take. And it soon became obvious that they were not going to give up a thing, that what they have, they hold. And they wanted to keep as much of Ireland as they could. And he said at that time, a couple of things had happened. And he really looked sad as he was talking about it. Clan de Gale, the AOH, all of those great organizations, which had put so much pressure on the British, which the British really worried about in some ways more than they worried about what was happening in Ireland. Those organizations had stopped. The pressure had stopped to a great degree. The momentum, the demand, the desire had stopped because everybody said, hey, we got a united Ireland in the cards. We just have to wait it out. Let's pat ourselves on the back to clear victory. He said that that had happened. The lines were drawn. Time went by. Everything seemed to harden. By the time we realized that the British had misled us, by the time they realized that they had lied to us, by the time we realized that our fellow citizens were under British rule, under that unionist orange state, and the British wanted to stay, it was too late to renew a fight, and it was too late to even get the momentum back to where it was necessary to put pressure on them. And the reason I bring that up today, the reason I bring it up to introduce the idea of one Ireland, one vote, a part of that partition, which the British pointed to, was in the all Ireland, one Ireland, one vote of 1918. Results came in in 1919 that had those majorities in Tyrone and Fermanagh and so many other areas that the British ignored, partitioning the country anyway. And they denied democracy or self-determination for the Irish people, and they kept as much as they could hold of Ireland, and that's what they do. Okay, why is that relevant today? Why is that so important today in the context of one Ireland, one vote? In 1998, we had another agreement, and it brought peace. But a lot of us were told at that time, we want to get out of Ireland. We want Ireland to be united. And you got to work with us. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to put this thing, uh, you can call it a border poll, a six-county vote, and the nationalist numbers are growing, and every nationalist will vote for United Ireland, and the unionists will see, they'll work with Sinn Féin and Martin McGuinness at Stormont, and they'll see that you're good guys, and they'll all work together, and everybody will want to live happily after, after in United Ireland, and all you got to do is work with us and help us, and we'll get out of Ireland. And that's, you know, I remember being in a debate that Malachi McAllister sponsored at the Grasshopper, and the next day Joe Cahill was in America, said, there's going to be United Ireland in five years. And I remember going to Ireland, and Martin McGuinness said in 2009, There'll be one in five years, that'll be 2014. And then they would talk about United Ireland by 2016. And now the talk is from Arlene Foster, who says that they're going to begin the second hundred years of Northern Ireland, of British rule in Northern Ireland. Like as if it's going to be second or third and fourth and fifth. The statistics on the potential of a border poll show that while almost nine out of ten Protestants will vote to remain in the north of our uh, part of British rule. 88%. Only just over 40% of Catholics are still working, want, and demand, and would vote for a united Ireland if it was put there. It would be an overwhelming majority defeat. But not only that, this deal that the British made to give us, that border poll, whenever it was asked for, they tell us now, no, it's only when we say it, uh, time is right. And once you get it, and if you lose, automatically you can't even ask again for seven years. And one of the saddest parts about it, and again, my family comes from County Offaly in the South. Uh, you go to the South, you visit there, 
and you talk to people and they say, well, we can't do anything about a united Ireland. There's no sense in us discussing it. Uh, they have to vote um, in the north in the six county poll, and then after that it'll be up to us, we'll have a referendum, and you know, that'll be okay then. <laughs> it's not even something we want to think about or look at or start to work on, not even push it. And indeed, with Brexit, there's been various times, it's not even part of the Irish Constitution anymore, that was done away with. So there is no constitutional mandate, <laughs> no UN basis to challenge British rule. That is what the British saw, did the same thing again, they told us they wanted to get out, and they were hammering the nails in to shut the door on Irish national freedom forever. That is what they did then, that's what they're doing now. And if you don't believe that, look at a couple of groups that we're supporting. Relatives to Justice, the Pat Finucane Center. Why are those groups so important? They bring pressure to bear for inquests, for simple justice. People were shot down at Bally Murphy by the British Bullets fired into them at point-blank range, and the British passed these quick things saying, oh, they're all IRA gunmen, and uh, just a miracle that no British trooper was injured, or that no witness saw any of these gunmen, other than the people with British guns. And Theresa May, just a few weeks ago, the new Prime Minister talked about how her soldiers were the bravest of the brave in the north of Ireland, who bravely shot down the people of Bally Murphy or Bloody Sunday or so many other places. And relatives for justice, they're also looking at cases, you know, they talk about all the unionist murders, or loyalist murders, and how terrible they were. And Theresa Villiers, the former British Prime Minister for the North, <laughs> just like James Brokenshire, who quoted what she said, talked about the pernicious counter-narrative. And what this means is, if you start telling the truth about the British involvement in loyalist assassination, it's going to destroy what the British are claiming and telling themselves about how great they were with the bravest of the brave and only responsible for 10% of the killings. Because the Unionists, the Loyalists, had no way to force the Force Research Unit of the British Army to give them the guns, to give them the intelligence, to give them a free, clear road, to give them the bullets, to give them the intelligence, to give them the immunity if they were from arrest everything they needed to commit those assassinations and then pay them for it afterwards and then say we have no responsibility. All right, what is one Ireland, one vote? Why is it so important? In 2007, it started in County Tyrell. And what they simply said is this. The position in Ireland had always been Ireland is one 32-county country. Look at the 1916 proclamation. Look at the Declaration of Independence. Look at what Republicans believed and fought for for many years. It simply says that if you're in Derry, or you're in Dublin, or you're in Donegal, or you're in any place, any other county in Ireland, that you should have the right to vote as one about the future of the, your country. You should have a say, an initial say, about ending British rule if that's where the future of the country lies. And we as people believe in freedom for all Ireland, certainly we would agree with that that the British shouldn't be able to call about the London Times, I remember originally called it, just simply the largest area that the British could hold, nothing more. It's not Ulster, Ulster has nine counties, and if you counted the people in Monaghan, if you counted the people in, in Donegal, if you counted the people in Cabot, you could have a majority then for a united Ireland. It's not all of Ireland. <laughs> After Brexit, one of the funniest things, the best arguments for one Ireland, one vote, was given by Arlene Foster herself. She said when Ireland voted against it in the six counties, and when the 26 counties were not even allowed to say as to what would happen at their country, because the British are the ones who are going to tell us about that, she said a region, talking about her six counties, a region in a country must not be allowed to veto the wishes of the whole country. So why is it that that region can veto the wishes of the whole country of Ireland and not vote as one? There is no more peaceful, legitimate way of arguing, of making a moral principle, of asserting a moral principle, than debates, than petitions, than giving out literature, asking people to sign. What they're doing is very simple. There are petitions here, Vic Sackett, 
Jim Sullivan have copies and can have literature. And all it says is, I believe, and if you don't believe in this, I don't know why you're a Hibernian with Freedom for All Ireland, it's one of the important purposes. You sign in a petition that says, I believe in one Ireland, one vote, that there should be one vote by all Irish people as to the future and freedom of Ireland. Something that the British fear, something that the British don't want to permit, something because if they allowed Irish and a vote throughout all of Ireland, if it rallied the people in the 26 counties, if you rallied the people in the north, you would have a vote for what they were always entitled to. Freedom for all Ireland, something they'd never want to allow. All we're asking people to do is take that petition, sign it, add your names, what they're trying to do, the 1916 society, is show that that's how Americans feel, Irish Americans who care about freedom for all Ireland. It show that that's what people in Dublin and Donegal, people throughout the north of Ireland also should feel. Show that that principle, where the British say we believe in national self-determination, means what we say it does, only six counties, that has to vote separate, and who knows, if it gets close, they'll probably cut that again. We want to put moral pressure on them. They want us to make more concessions just to get the border poll that they already agreed to in 1998. Let's make them make the concessions. Let's put the pressure on them. Sign up, stand up, put your name down. It's nothing more than a petition. I support freedom for all art. Yeah. That's one of the things that we're asking you to do. It's simply to write your name down as something you can be proud of. Be part of a movement that's going to bring that type of moral pressure on the British. And people tell me sometimes, well, you'll never get it. We'll never get it if we don't try, if we don't put pressure on the British. And look, they may not give us everything that we want, but they'll at least they're not going to be moved if we ask simply for what we already were, get, were supposed to have, and they can get more concessions from us in order to get it. Let's sign, take those petitions, distribute them. It was approved at a national convention of the AOH. Let's stand up for it. Let's use it in resolution. It's a simple initiative, but it's one the British are very worried about. And tonight also, I want to congratulate Kieran. A um, couple of things. Number one, Maliki McAllister is going to be speaking, and I'd ask everybody to pay particular attention. You know, I said last year, Reason he's in the situation he's in, facing deportation again. British want to make everybody who resists British rule criminals. They said it about George Washington. They said it about everybody who fought them in 1916. They said it about the people who fought them the, this generation. To try to brand Malachi McAllister and others a criminal, to make America take a stand on their side. And that is something we know better. We know he deserves to be here. We know that his home was attacked. We know that he's a patriot who deserves to be a part, to live here, just as every other patriot who came to America and sought refuge should be. So I want you to listen to him closely. I don't want to ask you what to do because I know he's got a better handle on it than I do. I also am very proud, thank you. Now some groups, sometimes when we ask for money for Freedom for All Ireland, people ask where the money goes. I sat with Mark Thompson and Relatives for Justice just a few months ago. He was with the Ryan family, the family of Liam Ryan, a close friend of mine, an American citizen, lived here for years, went back to Ireland, bought a bar, was shot down by loyalists. And the OUC just came to the house the next day and left, and said, oh, nobody will ever be caught. And indeed, they never looked for him. <laughs> and the only hope that those families have for justice, real justice, to show what really happened, to show British involvement, to put Britain in the dock, whether it's inquest or a British court, it's for groups like Relatives for Justice. There's a thousand other families just like them. The same thing's true of the Pat Finucane Center. Pat Finucane was somebody I knew personally. He was killed. Again, collusion. The British set it up. <coughs> Remember, I called Mario Biaggi after his death. And Mario called me back. He said, you know, the British ambassador says you're a terrible liar. Britain would never stoop to this. They would never use collusion. They would never pay high killers to assassinate a lawyer. <laughs> And uh, I said, well, Mario, they not only would stoop to it, they do it, they lie about it afterwards, and I'm glad we have you to tell them the truth that you don't believe. Those are the groups that we're supporting. What we do is important. I think all of us, myself included, stopped the momentum a little bit. We thought we were on the way to a united Ireland. We have more work to do. 
people in the north, the people in Belfast, the people in Derry, the people throughout the six counties. They deserve justice. They deserve freedom for all Ireland. Let's get behind here in Derry the Freedom for All Ireland Committee and work as an organization to see that they get. Thank you.